And I say, well, that's how we, you know, we pay for things, is through the bullpen. So, but the other thing I'm really interested in is what is called the philosophy of communication. In that particular endeavor, tries to figure out, and I'm borrowing from my colleague, Pat Aronson at Duquesne, how humans are communicatively situated in the lived world. How is it, in that word communicatively situated is a, is a real fancy academic thing. But what it means is, how do we place ourselves in the world? And that is to say, how do we? Because there's a certain sense in which human beings are always placing themselves and others through the words and the deeds and the meanings of those words and deeds. And so that's kind of what I'm interested in, in sort of a raw, you know, view. But I also want to talk a little bit about something called media ecology, which is one way I think about these questions, which is owed to Marshall McLuhan and a disciple of his named Neil Postman. And I think probably some of you remember that McLuhan had a famous statement that the medium is the message, and everybody thought, oh yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever asked him, well, what does that mean to say the medium is the message? And first of all, it begs a question, which is, what is a medium? And a medium is usually a technology plus a symbolic code. Your toaster, nice piece of technology, no symbolic code. Your cell phone, your television, the newspaper you may have read or saw that really nice picture of me in, which, uh, which is why I'm not wearing an orange shirt today. Uh, 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 you know, that's the symbolic, that is what a medium is. And so then the question becomes, what is the message? And the message is the consequence of the medium. What happens as a result of the existence of that particular medium? How does it change society? And this is gonna sound strange, but McLuhan, maybe because he was Canadian, his favorite example was a light bulb, which you can argue doesn't have a symbolic code, but it is a kind of technology. And consider how the light bulb changed the world Bear in mind that this was the first hotel that ever had electricity, meaning electrical lights. And think about the things you can't do in the absence of electronic light. I mean, how many of you were here during the hurricane, right? Power went down, you know, so you're sitting in a dark, candlelit room, and you're going, well, I can't read, and what can I do? And if you think about it, a lot of people's lives were organized on the assumption of the absence of electricity. Farmers, for example, many to this day, get up with the rise of the sun, which really does rise, by the way. That's a whole other conversation. So media can organize us by the technology, and that also gets us to the idea that McLuhan and his progenitor, Harold Innes, talked about, which is the bias of the medium. And when I say that, my students are going, oh yeah, right, the bias of the medium. Like Fox, conservative, and MSNBC liberal. And I'm like, no, that's not the kind of bias that McLuhan and Ennis are talking about. What they're talking about is the way the medium organizes time and space. So I'm going to talk about that's hence the time and space in the title. So the, having that sort of background, and, and so now I'm going to get to the idea of a hidden curriculum. And the reason I think the idea of a hidden curriculum is important is because the folks that are sitting over here that are a little bit younger than all of us, they've been subject to a hidden curriculum all their lives. Students don't walk into college on the first day, it's like, I'm Tabla Rosa. I know nothing. They learned things before they got here. And I'm sort of borrowing here from the, the late dean of the Annenberg School of Communication, George Gerber, who was a famous communication researcher. He says, the hidden curriculum basically talks about and means how the facts of life are depicted in the symbolic world and how those depictions form patterns. 
And his most famous example in the 80s, 70s, and 80s was something called the mean world syndrome. A lot of people prior to Gertner would take somebody in a room, and there's a famous study in psychology called the Bobo doll experiment. And what they would do is they would put a child in a room with a doll, and then they'd be able to watch somebody in the next room with the same doll. And when the adult walked in the room, they'd start beating the doll. And lo and behold, the kid would start imitating the doll. That led research to, to imply that violence was a learned behavior, and the way that children learn behavior was by watching TV. There is some truth to that. But after, with Gertner and after Gertner, people began to look at how the symbolic world cultivated people. And he came up with an idea that's still talked about in the literature called the mean world syndrome. And what the mean world syndrome meant was simply this. He had two categories of TV viewers. There were heavy viewers, people who watch four or more hours of television a day. And then there were light viewers, people who watch less than four hours a day. And you would ask them a series of questions, and these questions were based on the perception of reality around them, like in particular, how violent and crime-ridden the world was. Interesting thing, the more television you watched in the 70s and 80s, the more likely, and I'm not talking about the news, I'm talking about primetime entertainment in particular, because they also, the questions were based in part on coding content analysis from prime time. And people who watched a lot of television, this worldview was influenced by primetime television. They saw the world as much scarier than people who watched very little to no television, a much more frightening place. And in fact, you could argue that primetime, you know, if you remember primetime television back in the 70s and 80s, it was like Miami Vice. <laughs> which you know, created a kind of tourism problem for Miami for a lot of years. Because um, people go, well, it's all drugs and people shooting at each other. And that became the way people perceive things. In fact, I don't know if you realize it or not, but the home security industry actually multiplied during the 80s. And in part, it's because people became convinced even in neighborhoods I lived in, I used to live in a fairly upscale neighborhood in New Jersey where nobody had been robbed in 20 years. You walk by a house there, they had an ADT or a similar sign in front of it because people had become convinced that the world was a mean, scary place. Now, these patterns then cultivate a social order. And that is, what is good or bad in a particular society. And it can also be the aesthetic order as well, not just a moral order, but what we think of as pretty or good. And that kind of interplay between those two things leads to another question, which is the idea of decorum. And decorum in its Latin roots refers to the rightness or propriety of an action. Was it right? But if you also think about the word decorum for a moment, it's closely related to another word we all use, which is decoration. And that's important because one of the places that decorum was defined was in classical rhetoric. And, and one of the big arguments about rhetoric is, is it just, to use Plato's line, sort of like the sweetener you put into something, like a bad medicine that tastes kind of bad. You know, if you don't like the words, we sweeten them, and somehow that makes it better. That's sort of Plato's critique of rhetoric in a nutshell, which is a much longer version. But it's sort of this idea that rhetoric is a kind of de decoration. But that said, would you pay attention to something that you didn't find kind of interesting or pleasing and so, in classical rhetoric, the question was always about the appropriateness of one style to the subject. You know, for example, a funeral oration. Hopefully, you, you have, I've had to give a couple of these to parents. And, you know, usually, when you 
go give a funeral oration, you don't start by saying, yeah, I knew Charlie, he was a jerk. I mean, you could say it. I, I, I think you might be asked to leave relatively quickly. You can usually find something good to say about the person. That is the function of a funeral oration. And so that is the decorum, if you will, of a funeral oration. Outside of rhetoric, though, we also talk about social decorum. That is the appropriateness of behavior in a social situation. And that has to do with the presentation of a self, the way we present ourselves, in its particular place and time. I had a student ask me yesterday, uh, we're coming up on senior portfolios, and he said, should I wear a top? Now, you should know the senior portfolio is sort of the gateway to the real world, and it's where they present their resumes and their portfolio of work, hence why we call it portfolio review. And I said, well, if you want a job in the FBI, meaning in this case the food and beverage industry, you can come and wear your shorts and your t-shirt and your turnaround baseball cap, and that will be fine. I said, when I was interviewed here for a job some years ago, I showed up in a blue Brooks Brothers suit. I wore a regimental stripe tie and, and the appropriate Johnson and Murphy footwear. Because that's what I thought you should do. You should look kind of conservative. And I, by the way, apparently got the job. Common sense did not prevail. Here I am. So, you know, so there you go. Um, decorum is an important part of what is called the social second nature. And what a sociologist by the name of Norbert Elias calls the civilizing process. Usually when we think about civilization, a lot of us tend to think of the great books that you read Plato or Aristotle. And that's part of Western civilization. But what we forget is that along the way, you had to teach people how to behave. And in fact, if you go back to the Middle Ages, you know, people used to eat food with a knife. Have you ever been around somebody just eating food with a knife? It's not, especially if it's like roast beef and a knife. They're going to slice off a big piece, you know, put it in their mouth, and it's all kind of greasy and messy. And we would kind of tend to see that as inappropriate. Well, to get people to be more civilized, one of the things that the etiquette manuals of royal courts did was to tell people how to eat. And eventually that got added down to the question of, A, using a fork, and then eventually knowing what fork you use for what, which, by the way, once we get past the salad part, I'm pretty much lost. I got it. I mean, I, you know, I have been to a few fancy restaurants in my life, but don't know too much about them. And learning how to regulate those table manners, along with other things like bodily functions and sexuality and forms of speech. Elias claims leads to an internalized self-restraint. If you, if you are concerned about the question of what is appropriate, you have to restrain yourself to a degree. And that leads to that sort of inflammatory statement that you might have seen in the description, which I say, the digital media is the end of self-restraint. And what do I, why do I say that? For three reasons. One, all time is organized as now. There is no other time than right here, right now for anybody. There is no past, there is no future. Two, space is organized and has been since the advent of television. It's just moving along now and becoming more so into flows that are neither private nor public. In fact, you don't necessarily know the difference for reasons we'll talk about in a minute, or I'll talk about. And finally, consumption, that is, being a consumer, is the principal way things are. Now, before I get to those three points, one little thing I want to say. I'm borrowing from a political scientist, philosopher named Bernard Harcourt, which is, we now live in what he terms an expository society, which means that we make ourselves transparent for everyone. 
How many of you have a Facebook account? Okay. Anybody can look at that. Anybody can friend you, unless you go through the actions of unfriending them. How many of you have Pinterest? People can know what you're interested in that way. I, I don't think I'm that interesting, so I don't have that account. You know, I have one Snapchat. Anybody have Snapchat? I was actually apparently in a yeah was it, no it wasn't Snapchat. I was in a photograph at my gym that one of my students took while I, I was at the gym Planet Fitness out on US one, which is when I usually don't talk to anybody. Um, I'm usually there to work out. It's not like hey I'm hanging out, chilling, you know, I'm working out. Um, and somebody took my picture of me working out. I found out about it because other people had seen it. But you know, if, you know, think about how today you know about what happened on the United Air Flight because somebody took a picture, because somebody took a video. By the way, as of this morning, I don't know if you realize it, there is now, particularly in China, hashtag boycott China, uh, United. So by putting ourselves out there, and that is a choice we kind of make. We are constantly connected. I mean, now when I, you know, I used to get up, I would have the TV on and I'd be eating breakfast. Now because I'm department chair and we're going through registration, the first thing I do after I turn the TV on is I'm sitting eating my breakfast as I grab my cell phone and I open up my email account. Because usually I've got a complaint from a student like, I tried to get into your class. What was the one I got recently? Oh yeah, somebody, I was away from campus and Sunday at four o'clock in the morning, somebody sent me an email requesting a copy of the syllabus for a class that I teach that they are in. <laughs> so, you know, we live in this constant connected life through social and digital media, including, by the way, FaceTime, which is my wife's favorite because that way she gets to interact with the grandchildren who live a grand total of two hours from my house. Okay. So, time. We live in a time of what could be politely called presentism. If you think about it, the way we experience time, especially through digital media, is in the now. It's real time and it's always on. In fact, I'm always amused when I'm flipping channels, I have direct, no, I have Dish TV. We've got rid of direct, now I have Dish. And every time I hit a button to change channels, I see a little banner on the left side of the screen that says live TV. As opposed to tape TV. But I would know that because I'm pushing buttons to get live TV. So everything is now and always on. In fact, think about it. Email is giving way to texting. Students, by the way, there's pretty good evidence, prefer to text rather than an email. Um, blogs are giving way to Twitter. Not that anybody we all know likes to tweet at 6 o'clock on a Saturday morning, but he does. Facebook is giving way to Snapchat. By the way, Snapchat messages are not permanent. They go away. And what presentism is about is, is trying to deal with, frankly, our own imperm impermanence. We are not permanent. Nothing is permanent. There's a sense that nothing will be. Expectations are changing pretty rapidly about the world. So we live in a distracted present. And we try to understand what's happening now. But by the time we actually get that understanding, it's already flowed past us. We're in a new present. One of the things that happens as a result is the collapse of narrative. My wife and subsequently me are big fans of The Voice. The Voice has, if you think about it, there's no real narrative. It's not a story. It's not like classic American television. 
I mean, there's kind of a, you can make a story out of it, but it's really about individual performances if you watch it. And you sit there and you go, oh, I think that was pretty good. I think that was pretty good. And I like that one. I, and my wife's been watching since its inception, so she now has become the, the great song and singer critic, <laughs> which is interesting because she sings almost as well as I do. And the only place I sing well is in a paper bag. That's about it. So, and if you think about it, with a few exceptional movies, like Saving Private Ryan, like Fury, most of the movies that are very popular don't deal with the historic past. When I was growing up, much of the history I knew, which was probably wrong, came from movies. Because you had all those costume dramas, the Henry VIII, you know, based on Shakespeare, allegedly, or some other person. And you had the Scarlet Pimpernel movies, which was about you know, 18th century Great Britain and France. Um, now World War II has seemed to be ancient history. And you know, okay, there was Gladiator, which was like the worst Roman movie ever for a lot of reasons. And also, that also means that if there is no real past, it's harder and harder for people to think about a future orientation towards a goal. I mean, what is the goal of most young people? Get a job. It's not a bad goal. But what else could it be? What is the bigger vision? To have that bigger vision, you have to have an error. And you might say, well, it's the American dream. Well, students are now confronted with the fact that they will now probably financially be better than their parents. And this is the first generation that is true of. So many people have begun to question the American dream in that sense, as a financial matter. Not only that, when we attempt to measure the flow of time, you know, what, by the way, is the difference other than a minute between 1018 and 1019? And my watch, by the way, is, is wonderfully analog. I like it. I have members of my family. Why don't you get one of those really cool like digital Apple watches? Because I don't care about the difference between 1018 and 1019. Now, I was sitting in Jacksonville Airport on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. I was heading for Atlanta to get a connector flight. And that's the first time that the difference between, in this case, 130 and 131 really mattered to me because I got caught in the storm. I didn't leave Jacksonville. I was supposed to leave at 1 30, didn't leave till 9 30. Got, got to a hotel room that my wife, by the way, found on Expedia. Calling her saying, I don't know what to do. People aren't helping me. Blah, blah. I was like, oh, you're a stupid man. Finally got a hotel room. Um, but we, you know, it used to be that we would measure by other means, right? The original measurement was the sundial. And then you kind of only knew what, if you ever look at a sundial face, there's no mention of minutes there. It's like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, it just goes 12 hours, done. At night, it doesn't help you. <laughs> uh, then we went to clocks. My least favorite form of clock is a cuckoo clock. Refuse to stay in the homes of people who have them. I already know I'm not, so I don't need a clock to tell me that. <laughs> um, then we went to the wristwatch, like the one I had. But then we went digital, right? And so now there's a certain sense in which we're measuring nanoseconds. We're always engaged in the difference between that minute and the next minute. So by the way, there's another idea related to presentism, which is called present shock. You might remember that Alvin Toffler wrote a book called Future Shock. Uh, there's an author named Douglas Rushkoff who says, that's not the issue anymore. People now stress about the here and now, not what's going to take place in the future, but right now. And I hear my students in particular talk about stress all the time, and I keep looking at them. 
Dude, you're 19. Well, there's a sense that being in the here and now, you have to get everything done in the here and now. And they multitask, which is not the best thing to cope with. I had one student last semester who was really stressed because not only was she going to school, but she was working three or four part-time jobs and couldn't get her work done. That's the kind of stress of the present. And then you say to her, him or her, okay, I understand you need money now, but there's a long-term goal. And I think for many students, it's more and more difficult to see that long-term goal because they're so absorbed by what's happening in this minute. So that is time. What about space? Space is organized into flows that are neither public nor private. Starting with television, electronic media, in which digital media is a form of electronic media, so it's a different form, began a shift from formal front regions to an informal back region. If you think about it, cell phones used, used as a phone, because they can be used for other things. I mean, my phone is called a smartphone for a reason. It's smarter than I am, which is smart. And also, it's basically a computer. All cell phones are computers. That's why I can use Safari. I can look up stuff online. I was at a meeting, and at the end of the meeting, I went out to the hallway and bought a book that I heard about in the meeting. We'll get more to that in a minute. But most of the cell phone messages that we talk through, and most of the texts that we send are private, right? You're talking to somebody else, hey, how are you? I'm fine. Okay. I've actually sat through business meetings where I've seen people text. So you just now began to change the definition of that particular situation. Because you're now engaged in a professional setting with private messages sort of blurs the distinction. Electronic media tend to merge the personal and public spheres. And how do they do that? Because in a sense, they break down barriers. One of the reasons you know you're in this room is there are doors, there are walls, there are windows, so we get in light. But it's separate from what goes on below us, which are dorm spaces. The rest of this building, all the way down to the lobby, is basically student private rooms. Not real private, because you have to share, right? I've never lived in a hospital, I have no idea what goes on. Um, think about this. You might watch the State of the Union speech, which is a, if you think about it, the State of the Union is the only speech, the speech that was given this year was not a State of the Union. It's the only speech required by the Constitution. It says that once a year, the president shall inform the Congress as to the State of the Union. It's really formal. I mean, if you look at the people, they're all dressed up. They're wearing, you know, what I never like to wear, ties. I have a size 19 neck. When you get to that, it's like, yeah, who cares? Um, but they're wearing ties. There's a formal process. They're, the uh, man in charge of security for the house, I can't think of his name. Usher. I'm sorry? Usher. Usher, thank you. That was the word I was looking for. I've noticed that since I've got my hair has gotten whiter and grayer, I can't remember words anymore. It's sad. Yeah. But anyway, there is an usher. He announces the presence of the president. The president then walks through. The president shakes hands. There's a whole decorum as to how that's supposed to go, right? But you can watch that in your bedroom. You can be having chocolate chip ice cream in your bedroom, watching the president give a speech. And that begins to change the meaning of that speech, because for you, you might be watching a big deal formal setting, but you're doing so in the most intimate, private setting you can imagine. And television has changed the way people, specifically politicians, talk. Go back sometime listen to how FDR gave radio addresses. Now, part of it is he was a patrician, but his speeches are rather formal. Listen to Truman, a Missourian, among other people. And a little bit different, but 
was still formal. Kennedy starts to be a little less formal. You can just see a trajectory starting with the presence of television. And there's a little less formal, a little less formal. And at the same time, if you have a cell phone and you're watching your favorite TV show while Pickett is trying to earn his living, you can watch a love scene in the middle of my classroom. I've never known, right? Which is the most intimate thing one could possibly imagine, but you're watching it in a fairly public space. So there are these barriers are no longer. And what that means is that digital media begins to separate social place, that is the social meaning of something, from its physical location. I mean, Carl, our friend in the back there, is videotaping. Does this go on YouTube, Carl? Yes. OK. Um, and that will change the meaning very subtly, because it's going to depend on where you watch the YouTube presentation. This is a, the solarium is one of our more formal spaces. It also, incidentally, in my judgment, has the worst acoustics of any space on this campus. Uh, and I don't particularly like talk. In fact, we've had faculty senate meetings here, and I feel like I should get a tin, you know, one of those tin horns that people used to have. And say, Aren't you shy? Uh, and to borrow here from Meyerowitz, Electronic messages do not make grand social entrances. They don't announce themselves. They don't say, here we are. They steal into places like thieves in the night. You may not see them, but they're there. And the minute they're there, those messages begin to change the meaning of the space to the point that the title of the book I'm sort of bombing from here Meyerowitz's book title is No Sense of Place. Go back to the student and he asked me how to dress for, for a portfolio. You only do that if you don't know what the space means. Interviews, I said, unless you know for a fact that the company is indeed an informal company, like Google has that reputation, you should wear the most conservative clothes you own. That's my reading of place. But many people don't know the difference between place A, place B, place C, and place D. Some of that, I'm arguing, is digital media. And part of that has to do with consumption. The most, you know, when I was growing up, and probably when many, some of you grew up, how were you known? What did people do? What did people ask you? They go up and say, hi, what's your name? And then the second question was always, what do you do? I didn't like that question too much when I was a graduate student because we, we made one, no money. I made an entire $3,000 a year as a grad student, plus tuition. But think about it now, how people talk about who they are. And a lot of it is by the things they consume. In fact, there are groups that you can join that are consumers of this product or that product. You can join them on Facebook. You can join them in a whole lot of places. First of all, as I already indicated with my comment about my conference, electronic stores of some kind are always a click or a swipe away. And they know a whole lot about me. In fact, yesterday I opened my email and there was a bunch of emails from Amazon because I bought them. We have suggestions for you. Now, Amazon doesn't do that because they're nice people and they really <laughs> care about them. I mean, I know exactly one person who works for Amazon. He designs algorithms. And what I'm actually getting, oddly enough, is a response based on an algorithm. They looked and saw what book I bought. Based on that purchase, they predicted that I would be interested in a whole bunch of other books. There's nobody watching. It's all done by machine, and it's a click away. Um, we live in a culture in which an airline, 
probably neither Delta nor United, or a store knows more about you in some ways than your mother knows about you. Because they track your purchasing habits. And, you know, back when I was growing up, the big concern about information was Orwell, right? George Orwell? That, that 1984 was a scary book. And one of the reasons it was scary was the way they got information out of people. They convinced you ultimately that two plus two was five, not four. And the way they did that was by torturing you. Well, Amazon doesn't torture you. It doesn't torture you. Much of the data that private companies have about us, we give out ourselves voluntarily. And every time you do that, they then know something about you. And that can be good information, that can be bad information. One of the things I tell graduating seniors is, by the way, Google themselves. There's a lot of interesting things out there. You, know, you don't want to see pictures of yourself in a t-shirt with a, a red solo cup that would suggest to a prospective employer that you party. Also, there's a wonderful thing called mugshots.com. Do you know about this? You can look it up. It's an organization that gets all mugshots from all state, federal, and local law enforcement. You're ever arrested? I don't know if people realize this or not, but that arrest photo is, is public record. So you can look people up on what employers do. The other thing that employers look at besides Google and your arrest records is your credit rating. It used to be that only if you were going to work for a bank did an employer look at your credit rating. Now you're evaluated as a potential employee based on your credit rating. And the fact of the matter is, is that most students, not all, but most, have questionable credit ratings because they run up a lot of debt. And that, you know, because credit ratings are based on assets versus debt. You know, and I know this because, like many of you, I went through that when I was buying a house. So, in that we call it datafication. People are looking for data out there about you of one kind or another. One of the ways that they get us to do these things is what is called, you may have seen this in 60 Minutes on Sunday, brain hacking. That is, the apps we use on our cell phones create habits, and it's done very deliberately. For example, one of the ways you know you're really cool on Facebook is by the number of likes you get. And people worry about that. And they will go back to, they will go back and encourage their friends to like them on Facebook. Um, there are some media that looks for the number of followers you have. Snapchat measures your streak. You know what a streak is? It's the number of times you posted on Snapchat. There are people who now apparently teenagers who give their passwords away to their friends while they're on vacation so they can continue their streaks. It's a deal. Now, if you think about it, that means that somebody is, in a sense, good, cool, whatever you want to call them, because they are popular by the number of fits they get. That's also the way, by the way, Google if you call up a product on Google, I don't know if you've ever done this, you're looking for, like I look for shoes. Uh, it, you might notice I'm a little tall. I, yes, I have big feet to go with. And it's not easy to find size 14, let me tell you. So I look for shoes online. Whenever I go back to that computer, a couple things happen. One of which is, is that I am now shown shoes for sale on the website. I already bought my five pair for the decade. I'm done. <laughs> One for each day, that's all I need. Sneakers on the weekends, good. Um, also, the number.
number of times people view a website and use that website unless there's a paid site. Which if you look at Google, there are sites that pay to be at the top of the page. People assume it's only popularity, it is not. In fact, they will say this is an ad sponsored site. But also, the more popular a site is, the more likely it is to be seen. So again, it's a notion of popularity. And by the way, there's a really easy way to do that. It's called a bot. That is, you can have, if you program a computer correctly, you can have that computer go back and, and hit that site, and hit that site, and hit that site. That jacks up the popularity of that site, and it's online. It also leads, by the way, to an expectation about time. When is Amazon closed? When is online shoes closed? The answer is never. If you have a problem, their customer service will get back to you immediately. Remember what I told you about the student who emailed me at 4 o'clock in the morning asking for a copy of the syllabus? I, I didn't used to get those kinds of emails. I do now. And part of it is they have been trained to think that I'm part of the customer service system. And they expect everything to be, it's an analogy, everything should be like that. So, to sort of pull some threads together, Neil Postman, who wrote a famous book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, which came out oddly enough in 1984. Uh, but in that book, Postman argued that people were mistaken, Orwell was not the problem, Huxley was the problem. Huxley wrote, of course, Brave New World, partially as a response to 1984. In Huxley's world, People aren't imprisoned by things they don't like. There is no jackboot on their neck. They're imprisoned by the drugs and media they love. And what Postman then argued in his book is that if you want to think about it, the metaphor for America is Las Vegas. And he said that because Las Vegas is the show business capital of America. And what television did and what mass media did was to reduce everything to a question of show business. I would also point out to you that Vegas is not known as the land of self-restraint. From zip lines, which my wife, my wife is a gambler. She, she's a good Catholic. She went to, and, and did uh, all that stuff. But anyway. Uh, from gambling, zip lines to gambling to shows, you can do, you can have whatever fantasy you want. After all, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, unless, of course, somebody took a picture of you, or a video of you, and posted it on YouTube or your Facebook page. So. The bigger question then is with digital media. So does what happens in America stay in America? No. Anybody can watch any video that gets posted. So thank you very much. <laughs>